May it please the court, counsel, ladies and gentlemen of the jury. February 14, 2018, actually, started out as a rather nice day. It was Valentine's Day. And the weather? Typical South Florida February, February weather. Sunny, partly sunny, warm temperatures. The day was going along smoothly at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School is located at the north end of the county in Parkland, Florida. It's a large school, almost over 3,000 students attend that school. Um, and it was just a normal day in February. But excitement for the kids and students because it was about Tuesday. Years ago, there was a song about one moment in time. And one moment in time can really change everything. And on this day, at approximately 2.19 in the afternoon, Nicholas Cruz, and I'm going to only say his name once, from here on, I will refer to him as either the shooter, the active shooter, or the gunman. The shooter gets out of a Uber on Pine Island Road. There's a little path that, that goes into the school. And the school, it was 219. The school day ends at 240. So by that time of the day, the school monitors were going around and opening up the gates because students are going to be let out. School buses were coming in. Parents were coming up to pick up kids. Students who were old enough to drive would be able to drive out or go home. So having had attended that school, he knew a little path which, where the gate was now open that would lead him to what is known as Building 12. It's also called the 1200. You'll hear the 1200 building. Sometimes you might hear the freshman building or Building 12. All the same thing. It's a three-story building uh, built or opened at least in 2009. It contains 30 classrooms. Now, if I and get the I see if the monitor will work right. Well, put up um, the first one. There. Hopefully, everybody can see. Uh, this diagram is up. This is a uh, diagram of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. Um, it's, you can see all the different buildings, the campus, and way up in the top, sort of the top of the more of the right side is Building 12, and over far over on the other side is well, just to the uh, be to our my right is Pine Island Road, and there's a little path um, that's in and around. Uh, this area right, right in here. And that's where the gunman is walking toward the 1200 building. It's 219 he gets out. At around 220 in the afternoon, he's going to walk into the building. And you're going to see, you will see as the trial progresses, the video, surveillance video, you will see that the students, it's, it's a, kind of a normal day. Three students walk in just before he walks in. And then he enters the building and he goes, turns, makes a hard right, and goes into the stairwell. Now, I'm going to stop that story here because there's background information that you all need to know and understand in regards to this case and to regards to this defendant before we continue on as to what happened that horrible, horrible afternoon at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. The, the, the defendant, Scott Peterson, was a deputy with the Broward Sheriff's Office for approximately 32 years. Out of those 32 years, he was a SRO, what is known as an SRO, that's a school resource officer. And school resource officers in general are assigned to certain schools, and it is their duty under contracts that are signed between 
the cities or and the school board and a law enforcement agency. In this case, the contract is signed between the school board and BSO, because he was a deputy for BSO, and then he was assigned to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. And that contractual agreement puts the defendant under a duty to the school. He's there for security purposes. He's the lead security person at that school. And he has special powers that he's allowed to do that other officers can't. He can conduct an administrative search if he wants without probable cause, but only on campus. So he has special powers that are given to him to help keep the school safe, to make sure the students are doing what they're supposed to be doing. And in general, just to know the school itself, to know the buildings, to know the administrators, to know the teachers, to know even some of the students, so that if anything ever goes wrong, he is the person who knows, for the most part, where everything is. He's been in the school. He knows where it is. He has been the SRO at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas since 2009. So he was 28 years as an SRO, but he became Marjorie Stoneman Douglas' SRO in 2009. So that's nine years, approximately, before that fateful day occurred. Now, during that interim, those periods, the defendant has lots of training. He is, he is trained on active shooter scenarios. He is trained how to handle a situation where he is the only person there, the only law enforcement person there, to handle an active shooter. He's also trained that he has another officer with him, or, or a group of officers, how to go in and how to handle an active shooter type situation. For the most part, active shooter situation, you, you go toward the gunshots. You're trained to go toward those shots, to find that shooter, because every shot could be a death. In the old days, it was you know, for a perimeter, not after Columbine. It changed. The only, usually, active shooter scenarios happen very quickly. And you've got to get in and you've got to find the shooter, or do everything you can to find him so that you can stop the killer. Now, there's other things that, they, that the, uh, the defendant learns and the school um, administrators learn. As a matter of fact, just a month before this awful incident, they had a program for the school administrators to learn and the teachers about hardening their classrooms. And to what to do if all of a sudden you're faced with an active shooter situation. So the teachers and the administrators are learning that they need to, need to harden their classrooms, have safe places in their classrooms, keep the doors closed and locked, cover the windows. This practical advice that would help stop an active shooter. Now the defendant is also trained. He's trained as an SRO. I mean, he's trained on all the special things that an SRO does for a school. And he's also trained, of course, on his weapon, and how to use his weapons in, in whatever scenario he may face. So he becomes the SRO of Marjorie Stoneman Douglas in 2009. 2016, he has training on active shooter. In 2017, he has more SRO training. And finally, we come up in 2018, that training the month before was, was done at the school for the staff and teachers. And the defendant was there for that also. Now we go back to that day, that afternoon. First thing you need to understand is that there is surveillance throughout the school. There are surveillance cameras inside the 1200 building. There are surveillance cameras outside the 1200 building. There are surveillance cameras all over the school. They don't cover everything. There are certain sections that don't get covered. There's no cameras in the classroom. There's no cameras, obviously, in the restrooms. There's no cam cameras in the teacher's lounges. 
And sometimes there's just not a camera in certain areas or captures, captures a certain area. And one of those areas happens to be the very front of the 1200 the 12 building. That's where the shooter enters. There's two doors that go right into a main hallway, and there's a third door that goes into the stairwell. The school itself, the 12th building, has two stairwells. There's an east stairwell, and then one on the far end of the building that's the west stairwell. So, again, by looking at the screen, we're talking about the 1200 building. Or the building 12. At the time that the shooter enters the 1200 building, gets out of the Uber and goes into the 1200 building, the defendants and a lot of the administrators in the school, the school security specialist, Kevin Kelvin Greenleaf, and the, uh, the vice principals are all in and around the number one building. That's the administration building which you can see is actually it's south of the 1200 building, because this is north, east, west, and south. And if you don't really like directions or don't like east and west, um, north and south, unfortunately in this trial you're going to hear a lot of that. And I'll show you why in this second photograph. Mm -hmm. This is a this shows the interior of Building 12. And it's important because the shooter takes a certain route. He goes from east to west on the first floor west to east on the second floor, and then on the third floor, east to west. So in looking at that diagram, all of this is on the east side, see, and all the other side is the west side. So the way it's oriented, it's east and west, but the classrooms themselves are north and south. For example, classrooms on the first floor, 1256 or 1255 face north. Classrooms 1254 or 12, I'm sorry, third floor, 1254 or 1257 face south. And that's the same for all the floors. The first floor is down at the bottom, and you can see it's 1217 and 1218 are the furthest classrooms to the east, and 1202 is the furthest classroom to the west. And the floors are basically the same. There's bathrooms on each floor, and some of the floors have teachers' lounges or offices. So it's important to have that orientation of the inside of the building, and it's going to be important to have orientation of the outside of the building. The shooter enters the school with a, a gun bag and ammunition, quite a bit of it. He immediately goes into that east stairwell. He makes that hard right. Because just before him, you're going to see um, three students walking in, Ashley Bias, she's going to walk down for the farther end, the west end of the hall, and you're also going to see Martin Duquet and Luke Hoyer walking in just before he walks in. Martin and Luke will go down, go down slightly, go down the hallway slightly, and they will stop in front of the classroom, you can see on the bottom on the uh, first floor, in front of classroom 1215. And sitting in front of class room 1215, working on a computer, she had asked special permission, is Gina Montalto. So the three of them, Luke, Gina, and Martin, are in front, or they're in that little alcove. You can see there's, there's the 1215 classroom and the 1214 classroom, and they have the doors are in a little alcove, and that's where they are. Now, the shooter takes out his gun, and at the, just as he's doing that, another student happens to just walk through and into the stairwell by accident. And he quickly leaves. He, the, the, he sees the gun, he sees the shooter, and the shooter says, something bad's about to happen, get out, he gets out. And 
then he exits, the shooter exits that stairwell, bottom the bottom, goes out, takes his weapon, and fires it down the first floor corridor. So he's at the far east end, and he begins firing. This is around 221-ish, 221-33 seconds that he begins firing. And you're going to be also hearing, not just north, south, east, and west, you're going to be hearing a lot of times, because the timing is important as to where everybody is. So we know at that time, he's on the first floor of that building shooting. Where is everybody else? Most everybody else is over, if you're talking about the defendant or the administrators, they are over near the administration building, building one, and the other picture that I had up. There are some campus monitors. They're, they're in and around the campus because, again, they're getting ready to let school out in a few minutes. So they're, they're located at various different locations around the school. Shortly after those first shots are fired, the video from outside the number one, the administration building, shows security specialist Greenleaf and defendant Peterson meeting outside that building. And they start to walk, uh, walking out, they're not rushing, they're walking toward a cart. Everyone at the school uses golf carts. They use them to get around the campus. And they're going to get on the golf cart because information has come over the school radio that something is happening in the 1200 bill. Something's not right. So they go to get a cart. It turns out they can't get the key for the cart to turn it on. And they turn around, they start walking the other way, and another cart pulls up. And in the cart is school monitor Medina. Medina had been over by the 1200 bill. Now he comes over, and at the same, about the same time, the alarm system in the school goes off. Now this is another thing we have to discuss. The, the school, the alarm system, um, in the 1200 building, in the 1300 building, was a little newer than the rest of the school's alarm system. It was much louder. There were uh, alarms in, in every court, in every room, um, in the 1200 building, and every classroom had an alarm. Then they make a piercing noise when they go off. In the rest of the school, it would be like a siren alarm, but it would be heard throughout the school. If it goes off in one building, the whole school goes off. And it's controlled from the administration building. So as they're hopping onto the cart, uh, the defendant gets in the seat next to Medina. Medina's driving, he's next to him. And Mr. Greenleaf gets in the back. And they take off. Now Medina is driving right to the 1200 building. So they're now on their way to the 1200 building. Meanwhile, as that process is happening, the shooter has fired, and then those initial bullets hit and kill Luke Boyer, Gian Montalto, and Martin Duque. At least they initially certainly injured them, and then he later comes back and shoots them again. And that was the end. When he's done firing those initial shots, he turns to the building across from the 1215 building. You can see 1216 is across the hall. And he fires into 1216 through the, in, through the door and through the window that's embedded in the door. He fires into that classroom twice. And in that classroom, the shots hit and kill Alex Schachner, Elena Petty, and Elisa Allen. Now, you're going to notice when you're watching the videos. That almost immediately, after the shooter begins to fire, this white stuff starts to appear. It's like dust 
it, it, it just starts coming down. Like it was uh, snowing almost. He has, in his, what he bought to school was an AR, Smith & Wesson AR-15. Very, very powerful gun. Right, semi-automatic rifle. It's very powerful. And the percussion from that rifle causes dust. Remember the building was built in 2009. The ceiling tile has been up there now for about nine, nine years or so, because it's 2018. And all the dust that had accumulated there is falling down. And then probably maybe some of the construction dust that was left up there. But anyway, it all comes down. And what that does, it messes a little bit with the school surveillance system. It makes it stop and start because it, it's based on motion. It only records when he sees motion, detects motion. So it stops twice, or two or three times as he's going down to the first floor. And so you don't, you, you just see a, a still photo and a still picture, and then all of a sudden he'll start moving because the dust was too heavy and it was causing trouble with the cameras. It's that same dust that then sets off the alarm. And that's the fire alarm that goes off. Now, it, the fire alarm is very loud, as I told you. It's not on all that long, less than a minute or so, because it's controlled by an administration building. And they can go in and turn it off, because it's loud. And the normal practice is to go and turn it off and have people go to see what the, what, whatever set off the alarm, they go and check it out, and then they decide whether, you know, they need to call back to the administration to um, restart it because there is a fire and you've got to evacuate the school because that's the plan. If there's a fire, you evacuate. And then they can call over the, the school uh, PA system into the classroom to let them know that's what's happening. So the alarm would shut off after just being on a little short while. It's a, it is on, and then it is off while the shoot is on the first floor. He hasn't left the first floor. It's on and off. And it really doesn't come on for about a, over a minute after he begins the shoot. He starts again. He continues down the hallway. And he approaches another classroom. And he shoots into that classroom, which is actually the classroom that was next door to where Martin and Luke and Gina were outside of 1215, he shoots into 1214, and there he kills Nicholas Gourett and Helena Ramsey. He continues down the hallway, and he shoots again further down the hallway into 12, 13, and he tells Carmen Shintra. It is at that point, when he is down the first floor, he's made it down, as you can see, where 1213 is, he's made his way down the floor, first floor, it is about that time that the security cameras pick up that golf cart. You can see in the distance that golf cart all of a sudden it appears on the screen, it crosses the screen, and then it disappears. Because it's now going to stop to the, on the southeast corner of the 1200 building. I'll put the other map up for just a second. Comes racing, comes racing between the seven and eight building, and it goes to the southeast corner of the twelve building, while the shooter is still on the first floor. He is now down toward the end of that hallway. Now, prior, just prior to that, in the car arriving, a school monitor, Chris Hickson runs into the 1200 building from the east end. He's running into the building, I'm sorry, from the west end. He runs into the building, between, it's in between 12, 13 and 12, and he runs at the west end of the 12, 12 building. Remember, the shooter he initially fires down the hallway, and then when 
Chris Hickson comes in through those doors, those west doors, he fires again, and he hits Chris Hickson, <coughs> the monitor, and Hickson is hit, and he rolls off, and he rolls off to the north side of the hallway. There's like a, a, a little uh, indentation because there's a, either a bathroom or there's a closet there, and he rolls over that way to get out of the line of fire in the hallway. But he's, he's, he's injured. He's still alive, but he is injured. The uh, monitor, um, Medina, he drops off the defendant, and he drops off Greenleaf, the security uh, specialist, I, as I said, at the southeast corner of the 1200 building. Mm -hmm. Just about at the time, the shooter now has made his way all the way down the hallway, and as he gets to the end, he looks and he sees Chris Hickson. And... It appears that he fires again into Chris Hickson. And then he turns. I'm going to put the other photograph back up now. He turns, because now he's at the far, far east, west end of the first floor. So he is all the way down at the far west end. And these, those um, red and black markings that you see, those are just uh, the placement of security cameras. We're on in the school, on in the 12 hundred. So now he's made his way all the way down the first floor. And he has killed Luke, Gina, Mark, <laughs> Alex, Alisa. Helena, there's Elena and Helena, Nicholas, Carmen, and Chris Hickson. And um, Alex. He turns, he's going to go up to several. He's going to go up to the second floor. He's going to turn to his left and go into the first floor stairwell at the west end of the building. And as he does that, the timing could not have been worse. As he turns and goes into that stairwell landing on the first floor, the school monitor, another school monitor, Aaron Feiss, is rushing into the building. And Aaron Feiss opens the door to go inside and the shooter is right there and he shoots and kills Aaron Weiss. And Aaron Weiss does not make it inside the building. He's shot twice, he's killed, and he falls on the outside, the outside patio. The defendant and Greenleaf are at the other end of the building. They are at the far other end of the building, the outside. They are about as far as away from the shooter as they could possibly be at that point. Those shots are heard. The defendant will yell shots fired into his BS he has two radios. One is the school radio, one is the BSO dispatch. He will yell shots fired. At the same time, you'll see video of uh, students who were evacuating the 700 building. And now this is where things get a little interesting, but a little complicated in the sense that you have a fire alarm go off, and then it gets shut off. And there's no, it, it, there was no reporting back of what the fire was, so it didn't, nothing came over the school, you know, the PA system. So the kids in the 700 building start to evacuate. They're doing what they're supposed to do when there's a fire. So they start coming out. That building faces the 1200 building. And that building does not have an inside. The corridors are all, it's constantly all facing the inside. So this is the 700 building. And the old students are coming out because they're following their fire evacuation plan. When they hear the shots. And you can tell, they're all kind of just walking out because they think it's a fire. 
and then all are drilled, you know, most likely, and then all of a sudden they hear something and they just go scattering back to the same building. Yeah. Um, Shooter continues up and now on the second floor. Now, the kids in the 700 building were evacuating for a fire break. The students and teachers on the second floor of the 1200 building have heard the gunshots. They had the training the month before about what to do when you have an active shooter, and they have all gone into their classrooms. They've gone into the safest portions of those classrooms, the hardened areas, those areas where if you shoot through the door, you don't open it, but you shoot through it, it should be locked, you wouldn't be able to hit anyone because they would all be in a hardened corner. And when the shooter gets up to the second floor, it's empty. There's nobody in the hallway. Totally empty. And he begins to make his way down the second floor. Now he's going again from west to east. He's made, he's done the whole first floor. And he's going the other direction on the second floor from west to east. And as he goes down that floor, he shoots into classroom 1231. There's no, nobody to hit, but he shoots three, three rounds into that classroom. And then he'll continue further down. That classroom 31 faces the north side of the corridor. And then he shoots into 1234, which faces the south side of that corridor. Nobody in that room either. It's now we have to go back outside. What's happening outside, right? For approximately 27 seconds, you do not see Kelvin Greenleaf or the defendant Peterson. You don't see them because there's no camera in front of the 1200 building. They are standing where they were dropped off. You do see the cart that brought them there, with Medina driving it, it goes off. You see that go off into the distance to the east. But they are left there. And they stand there for 20, approximately 27 seconds or so. And then they move. And they move. And I know this is getting a little back and forth, but we have to. A little hard to tell, but they move from the southeast corner of the 1200 building to right here between the 700 and the 800 building. There's an alcove. That is the alcove that the cart had run through and was coming up from building one to building 12. So there's this, there's an alcove there, and that's where they move. They go from the 1200 building to the alcove. The defendant will never leave that alcove while the shooter is in the building. And actually doesn't leave it until almost 40, give or take, 40 minutes, or a little bit longer, when everything is finished. The whole time he's there is about 48 minutes or so. Uh, and that is from when he first arrives, which is where the shooter at that point is on the second floor until it's all over. By 3.11, they were already evacuating kids at the building. Kelvin Greenleaf is over there with him. That's the, um, he's not a police officer, he's just a security specialist. He doesn't have a weapon. The third floor. You will hear video, you will see a video from the third floor. You will be able to hear what they heard coming from the first floor when the gunshots are being fired down on one before the alarm goes off. And everyone is sort of, you'll see, they're all sort of looking around like, what, what was that? What was that? And somebody says, they give different explanations for what it, the noise was that they were hearing. <laughs> Then the alarm goes off. And when the alarm goes off, they decide to start to evacuate because the fire alarm is going off, so we'll evacuate. Now, some kids initially go to the east stairwell, but both of the kids go to the west stairwell. And 
it's it's not it's organized because they, they just think it's a fire drill because now that the alarm is on they're going to walk out. It turns out that as the kids on the west end of the north of third floor of that building, they're all trying to go down the stairs. So that would be here. Now, remember, we're talking about the 1200 building, the defendant is over here with Kelvin Greenleaf, and we're talking now about the third floor of the 1200 or the 12 building. And that is this floor here on the top, west end and east end. On the east end, the kids sort of back up a little bit out of this, you know, they're taking the time of getting down the stairwell and starting to back up. And one of the students, Armand, gets pushed toward the window. And he can look, he looks down and he can see Greenlee. And he can see Scott Peterson. When they where they were first dropped off at the southeast corner of the 12th window. And he sees that Debbie Peterson has his gun out. So he knows something is not right. Well, they're there getting ready to evacuate when the shooter now is on the second floor and he shoots into those two classrooms, right? They hear those bullets and you see them all turn around and fly back up to the third floor. And they're all going back to their classrooms. There are students at the very, the very first students in front of the whole crowd who are going down that east stairwell do not turn around. That they continue down. They continue down to the first floor. One of them goes and starts to look. They come down that exactly where the shooter had started, right? They come down that stairwell on the east side. One of them goes and looks down the first floor quarters and then the corridor, and other ones follow. And all of a sudden, you will see from the camera on the first floor and then from the stairwell, they have seen the carnage. They have seen what happened on that floor, and they go flying out the doors, the first floor, east doors, the same doors Cruz came in, I'm sorry, the shooter came into, just a few minutes before. When that happens, right, remember those shots went off on the second floor. The defendant and Greenleaf have now moved to that position over the 700 building, that alcove. And they have a, a perfect view of the 1200 building, the east side, and its whole south side. Because you, they can, from this spot, they are able to see, from that spot there, they can see the 1200 building, east end, and the south side, all the way down to the west part of the 13 and 13 building. Those students, those five students, are flying out of the 1200 building on the east side. Nobody stops them. Nobody asks them what's going on. You see security specialist Greenlee, who's bah, he's to the south, which would be he, if the defendant is here, he's just sort of right behind him. And the camera picks up Greenlee. It, that camera picks up Greenlee. There's another camera that's looking down the side of this building, all the way down here. That picks up Defendant Peterson, that points when he's coming in and out of that alcove. He stays in the same spot, but he moves a little bit back and forth. And sometimes you can see him, and sometimes you can barely see him. But Greenleaf is right behind him, and you see Greenleaf like going, you know, to the kids, move or just just gesturing at them. Nobody talks to them. Nobody finds out why. You, why are they fleeing out of the building? And there's no cameras on that east end of the building to show them coming out. You see them from the inside right after they see what happened on the first floor, but you don't get to see what happened when you're outside. But nobody's talking, not, nothing, they're not talking. And that was a reaction because the rest of the students had heard those shots on the second floor and they'd all run back upstairs. You're also going to hear a video, a see a video, because I, let me back up just a little bit. I have told you there's surveillance video, right? That's from the school, and there's no sound. There's no sound, and it's motion censored. And that's what makes it start and stop. There's also body-worn camera video that comes from the police officers, BSO. 
and they have their cameras on their uh, vests to the front, and so they have the films what they're doing as they're going through their, their day. Then you'll be seeing body-worn camera. That does have sound. You'll also be seeing cell phone video, which of course, as you all know, has sound and picture. Back on the first floor in classroom 1213, a student is making a um, recording of what's happening. While they're, they're hunkered down in the room, she makes a recording on her cell phone. And the first recording picks up. You hear the gunshots, and the fire alarm is going off. The second report, the fire alarm shuts off. And you'll have an opportunity to listen to it. It's when the defendant is on the first floor, and he has, not the defendant, but the, the shooter's on the first floor. And he has moved down. In the first video, he's right on the first part of the floor. In the second video, he's made his way to when Eric Weiss comes in the building. And on that video, you hear, bam, bam, bam. And that's Aaron Weiss being killed. And then you hear the shots, the bam, 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 from the second floor. Three, three shots into 1231 and three shots into 1234. And now, the shooter has finished the second floor. He gets into that stairwell, the east stairwell. He's one flight above where he entered. And he's going to climb up the stairs and he's going to enter the third floor. The kids in the third floor who were evacuating for that fire drill don't all make it back in the classrooms. There's still people in the hallway. The video that a student in the uh, first floor had, you'll see that was recorded, the second one, captures the sound of what happens when the shooter gets onto the third floor. He opens the door from that stairwell, he gets, he's on the east end, he turns again to the west, just like he did in the first floor, and he starts firing, and you can hear it on that cell phone video. <laughs> At the exact same time, Deputy Peterson is three floors down over at the alcove. So he's just, just catty corner and, and below of where the shooter is. The shooter's up here on the third floor and he's over here. He's on dispatch. He's talking to BSO dispatch and in the background you hear all those shots. Those shots as that shooter comes out of the door, the very first classroom is 1256, which that classroom faces north, 1256. This is the east end of the third floor. And teacher Scott Beagle has gotten all his kids back into the classroom, and he's attempting to get the door closed and locked when the shooter comes out of the stairwell. And he shoots and kills Scott Beagle. He doesn't make it back into the classroom, he just collapses right there at the door in the hallway. Right next door in Mr. Beagle's classroom is classroom 1255. Stacy Lapel is the teacher in that classroom. She gets all her kids in and she manages get herself in and close the door, but she does get hit. She survives, but she does get hit. Now, he's also been firing down the hallway, just like he did in the first floor. Those bullets are flying down the third floor hallway. Those bullets hit Meadow Pollock. They hit Carol Lockwood. They hit Joaquin Oliver. They hit Peter Wang. They hit Jamie Gutenberg. They injure Anthony Borges. They injure Marion 
Kalachenko, and they injure, um, well, I've already told you, Stacey Lapel is already injured. Meadow Pollock and Kara Laughlin end up here. They're on the south side of a locked classroom, I'm sorry, right here, south side of a locked classroom, in the little uh, indentation, the little area where the two doors are, just like on the first floor where Gina, uh, Gina and Luke and Martin were, but they're up in the room. They've been hit. You can't see Kara, but you do see Meadow. She's moving. And I'm sorry, and the, it, there was one more person hit, injured, but not killed, was Kyle Lehman. So it was Kyle Lehman, Anthony Borges, Stacey Lapel, uh, and Marion Kavachenko. The doors to the bathrooms on three and one are locked. They were locked because there were vaping problems going on in the school, and so only the doors to the bathrooms on two were open so they could control traffic in and out of the bathrooms. Joaquin Oliver and Kyle Lehman and another kid make it into that little alcove that's in front of the bathroom, which is on the north side of the hallway, or the, the end here, on here, on the third floor. The shooter reloads, and when he reloads, some of the kids and the teacher are able to flee and get down and out the West End stairwell. Jamie Gutenberg was one of them, but she got hit just as she was approaching the exit door to the stairwell, and it hit her in the spine. She makes it outside the door and collapses onto the land. She's on the west side, the west end stairwell, third floor, and she collapses on the land, and she, she dies. Peter Wang is also running towards that door, and he gets hit. And he falls down, and then he sort of is sitting up against the far west wall. The doors, on one side, there's doors that go out to the stairwell, the west stairwell, and then there's doors to a teacher's lounge on his other side, and he's leaning up against the wall. Anthony Borges is, is, has fallen, he's, in the, he's on the floor. Um, and he can't move. He's in great pain, he survives, but he's in great pain, he can't move. Um, Kyle Lehman has been shot badly in his ankle. And he's in there with Joaquin. Joaquin can't move. Joaquin is sitting also up against the wall. He can't move. And Kyle and the other kid, that are, the other person who's in there with him, they actually, when the shooting, when he reloads, they take off. And he's able to get out of the building. The shooter reloads, goes down the hallway, and as he passes, Para and Meadow, he fires again. Killing both of them. He continues down. He looks to his right, outside of the men's room, because the door is locked. It's Joaquin out. Joaquin puts his hand up as though to shield himself, and the bullet goes through his hand and into his brain and instantly kills him. He then continues down the rest of the hallway, and he fires numerous shots into Peter Wang, killing Peter Wang. You now have 14 kids, 14 students, and three staff members, teachers, and staff members of the school who have been shot and killed. The shooter gets the end of the hallway and goes into the teacher's lounge. And he's at third floor, west end. And he goes into the teacher's lounge. The defendant, Peterson here, is still in his position between the, in the alcove between the seven and eight hundred buildings. The shooter is 
shooter goes into the lounge and he sh fires five shots into the hurricane-proof windows. Some of them face south, some of them face west. Five shots to the south, five shots to the west. The bullets do not go anywhere. Those are, the windows are hurricane-proof. It breaks and shatters them. But they really don't go and they don't hit anyone. He's done. Six minutes, 40 seconds. He's done. He walks out of the teacher's lounge, in and around, uh, it would be about 2, 27, 30 or 40 seconds. You can see him, he walks across, directly across in front of Peter Wang and into the doors that lead down the stairwell. Jamie Gutenberg is still lying on the landing. And by just a few seconds before 2.28 in the afternoon, he exits the west end of the troll. He goes all the way down the stairs and he goes back into the court. He doesn't go through that door where Aaron Weiss was. The door that leads just into the fairway. He goes through the door that leads to the first floor. Turns sharp left and out. Side. He then proceeds. He's heading west. And he's heading west and a little bit south. Because he's going to go, he's fleeing toward uh, that west side of the school. So he comes out this way. And when he comes out here, <coughs> Ben Peterson is still here. And he doesn't see him. And then the shooter runs it off, and then eventually about an hour or so later, he's captured. Then Peterson remains in this position until approximately 11 minutes after 3. Some approximately 40 minutes after he had gotten to that position from when he left the 1200 building, outside the 1200 building. You will hear uh, from several witnesses. You're going to hear from Kevin Kelvin Greenlee, who says that when he was there with Ben Peterson by the 1200 building and then in the corridor at between 7 and 8, that those shots were coming from the inside of the 1200 building. You're also going to hear from Officer Arnold. He is way over here. It's a little hard to see. There's a baseball diamond. And he, on his part time, when he's off work, he waters the baseball diamond to get it ready for the nighttime baseball games. When he starts to hear the commotion and the shots, he starts moving toward um, the trouble. And he will come all the way over into this general area. And he also says, the shots are coming inside the 1200 building. shooter, get into your classrooms, get into your hardened areas. He, you will see him as he, he kind of gets closer to the building and then he pulls away. After that, believe, after that, now I told you, the shooter left that building, was out of there by 2.28. At 2.32, Coral Springs Police Department, they enter the west end of the building. And they begin to, 
just search the building, you see Hickson, he's still alive, they put him on a cart, and he's carried away and shortly thereafter passes away. A few minutes later, uh, Coral it's a mix of Coral Springs and BSO. They will enter both sides. Um, they will enter the east end of the building. And when they do that, when they enter from the east end of that building, Defendant Peterson is still in his position. <coughs> and he remains in his position as they enter that building. And he is the, remember, as I told you, the one man who would go the inside of that building to that. If you, if two days later, in an interview with Detective Percio, Detective Percio is taking interviews with everybody. He's the lead detective on the, the Cruz case, the shooter's case. And he's just taking statements from people to find out what they did that day and what was going on so they can gather information. And the last charge that you heard the judge read you, the perjury charge, it comes from that statement, wherein the defendant doesn't, or says that he only saw so many children, and he only, and he come out of the building and didn't see any children, and also, that also he heard only a few shots. And none of the perjury charges arise out of that end of, um, out of that interview. It was a horrific, horrific day. And 17 beautiful people were lost. Many, another 17 were injured. The ones in this case, the charges all stem from the third floor. They were all from either people who passed away on the third floor or who were injured on the third floor. But overall, it was a unspeakable, death, horrible thing. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we are here because my client was sacrificed. The evidence will show that he was thrown under the boss. My client is not a criminal, and the evidence will not prove that he committed any criminal offenses at all. He didn't know where those shots were coming from precisely. We've got 22 witnesses under subpoena who will come in here and tell you that they too heard the same shots my client did and could not discern precisely where the shots were coming from. There was a pronounced echo and reverberation that the witnesses will talk about that left them hearing the same shots and wondering, where is that coming from? He did everything that he possibly could with the limited information that he had to help serve and protect Everybody at that school. He was sacrificed. Judge, in your honor. Our so, opening statement. Again, ladies and gentlemen, this uh, purpose of the opening statement is for the lawyers to tell you what they believe the evidence is going to show. And I'll remind you what the lawyers say is not evidence. Go ahead, sir. Details matter. We want a jurors who are extremely detailed. And I'm going to get into the weeds so you understand specifically what occurred. Numbers. Let's talk some numbers because they don't lie and that kind of sets the parameters of what happened. First number, 636. Six minutes and 36 seconds. That's how long that monster, Nicholas Cruz, was in the 1200 building committing his atrocities. Nearly six minutes and 36 seconds. My client was there at the end of his rampage for 4 minutes and 15 seconds. I want to make sure you all had notepads so you can write down these details. They're critical. 4 minutes and 15 seconds. What is not in dispute at all 
is that when the shooter is on the first floor killing faculty and children, my client wasn't even on the scene yet, which is why he's not charged at all with those offenses. 17 and 17, more numbers that do not lie, that are uncontroverted. 17 children, 17 total people were killed as a result of this atrocity. 17 were injured. Of the 17 that were killed, 14 of them were children. I want you to take a look and understand why we're here. We're here because of this monster. This person chose to commit one of the worst mass shootings in our nation's history. He destroyed families. He destroyed lives. Everyone was affected by his terror. He is the one to blame for what happened that day. That is not in dispute. He chose to arm himself with an automatic, powerful weapon and kill innocent people. Those are actual screenshots of him doing what he did. <clears throat> Not if, but when you have very strong feelings in this case, whether it be because of the photos that they intentionally introduce, showing blood, gore, understand who's responsible for that. Not my client. More numbers. 32. 32 years my client dedicated himself to law enforcement and serving this community. 32 years. An unblemished record. You know, we have this image of cops as they age, as being in one of two categories. That, that idea that you've got some donut-eating, lazy cop who's got one foot in retirement, can't wait to get out the door. That was not my client. Every single witness we've spoken to, and who will testify, will tell you, he was an exemplary officer. No ideas that he might be a coward in any way. He was great at what he did. A loving father of four children, two who served in the military, lovely wife, he went to work that day never thinking that some sick, twisted monster would do what he did. My client was one of those ones that Marjorie Stoneman Douglas, who would get in the middle of kids who were fighting. He would risk his life to protect others. If anybody needed any investigation done, he was there for them. Everybody will tell you, teachers, faculty, if they needed something done, he was the guy. He took care of them. He devoted his life to what he called his children. His children. He's broken up about what occurred. He was an award-winning deputy. In 2012, he won Parkland's Deputy of the Year. Never What's the legal objection? It's Armin, and it's also... It's that was part of, I believe, our motion to eliminate in this case. The court ruled on it and previously. No, it's, it's overruled as to both, again, what the attorneys think the evidence is going to show at trial. Go ahead, sir. The evidence will show that he won, in 2012, Parkland's Deputy of the Year. In 2015, he won Parkland's School Resource Officer of the Year. And then once again, in 2016, he won Parkland's Deputy of the Year. This is within just two years of the February 2018 vicious attack on that school. This was an award-winning, decorated officer. He was an elite officer who did his job zealously and professionally and with courage. 
So what we have here is a man with a decorated history of serving the community for 32 years, and in literally four minutes and 15 seconds, they're claiming he became a criminal. That's what they're alleging. And understand what we're here for. We're not here to say, well, could he have done things differently if he had certain information? Administratively, should he have been, you know, reprimanded? Should we award money to people? That's not what we're here for. We're here for one purpose. Because as we've learned, someone from their office filed a document, an information, a charging document, claiming 11 counts. And he has stood before this court and he said, I am not guilty. And for four years, every time he came to court, he said, I am not guilty. Because he's innocent. And he did not accept responsibility for crimes that he did not commit. <laughs> now, how did we get here? We'll talk about that now. How does a decorated officer who did everything he could with the knowledge that he had, and we'll get into that, how does he sit as a defendant with his liberty at stake in criminal court? Details matter. So let's go back to February 14, 2018. That's when the massacre occurred. Now, whether it's right or wrong, the people at the top always get blamed. Sometimes it's justified, sometimes not. If it's raining outside, well, it's the president's fault. Gas prices go up, president's fault. But sometimes it's justified. What I will not do in this case at all is tell you whether Sheriff Scott Israel, who was the head of the Broward Sheriff's Office, whether it was justified that he was getting tons of criticism immediately after this. I will not get into that, because I don't like the idea of anybody blaming someone without having all the facts. I won't do that. I won't be a party to that. You've got one finger pointing out, you've got three pointing back. But what I will say is that the governor did find that he was incompetent, and he was removed from office. But before that ever happened, Sheriff Israel, who was on the hot seat, did a Jake Tapper CNN town hall meeting. Is your objection irrelevant? Well, as to the relevancy objection, it's overruled. But uh, Mr. Agar, so let's stick to what you think the evidence is going to be in this case. Go ahead, sir. If they don't call him, we will call Sheriff Israel to testify. We will. We have no burden in this case, but we will make sure that we call him to testify. And he will admit to you that he was under pressure. Naturally so. He's at the top. People started to question why certain deputies didn't go in, and we'll get to why they did. He wasn't the only one, by the way. It was at least six others that we will call to testify. We will explain why they didn't go into the building either. They also thought the shots were coming from a different area based on the reverberation and based upon the echo. Good, meaningful, dedicated officers. Some who initially lost their job, but then fought and got it back. And they're working now. They have their jobs. My client's fighting for his liberty. But Sheriff Israel took that heat. I'm not saying it's justified, but he was under the gun. A lot of heat's coming his way. So he goes on CNN town hall meeting with Jake Tapper, televised, for everybody to see. And he defends consistently. Before that, after that, he's defending his officers. They did the best they could with the information that they had, based upon the circumstances. He knew no one had done anything wrong. Well, that didn't fly. He will tell you that even after he went on to that Jake Tapper town hall meeting, yeah, people didn't like some of the things he said, including that he showed great leadership. And his officers didn't do anything wrong. You know, he took a lot of heat. So what does he do? Understand, he's the head of BSO. Thousands of deputies. But like any of us, we have supervisors. And if something looks wrong, you bring in somebody, and you say, well, tell us what happened. You know, why didn't you go in? And you sit down and talk to them. You think that occurred? No, because that didn't fit his agenda. What you will learn, the evidence will show, is that Sheriff Scott Israel put Sheriff Scott Israel number one. 
Sheriff Scott Israel's ego is not his amigo. So what he did is he, the very next day, after he took the heat after that CNN town hall meeting, and just so we're clear, this is who we're talking about. This is him at the CNN town hall meeting, defending everybody, no problem. But then he took the heat. And the very next day, this is him, at a very famous press conference that set into motion why he's sitting there. Objection, Your Honor. Well, again, it's overruled. If uh, that's what the lawyer believes the evidence is going to show. Again, ladies and gentlemen, I'll remind you opening statement this is not evidence. What the lawyers tell you is not evidence. It's what they believe the evidence is going to show. The objection is overruled. Go ahead, sir. <laughs> this press conference set into motion such unbelievable pressure. We'll talk about what happened. Let's talk about what he said and what he didn't say. He announces to the world, with all the media there, this was the biggest case around. The biggest atrocity, if people want to know what happened. And at that press conference, he said, regarding my client, well, he didn't go in to kill the killer. Now, what did that mean to all of us? I mean, anyone watching. Okay, wait a second. Someone from the police force, it's not very usual, he made it so credible, is it's not usual to hear a police officer say something negative about another police officer. But even worse, what made his words so problematic is that it came from the top. A guy that people knew, a public figure, who spent his career trying to get everyone to perceive him as credible and believable and honest. And now he's throwing my client under the bus. He's saying he should have gone in to kill the killer. What did that mean to all of us? Number one, wait, I guess he must have known where the shooter was. Number two, my goodness, he must have known kids were being killed in that building, which he did not. Okay, good afternoon, everybody. He sat back and did nothing. He cowered it and did nothing during that time period. Well, naturally, all of us, and I group myself, said, my goodness, what kind of person does that? It was perfect. The media ran with it because now you had a villain. They had crews, but now you had a villain. Imagine a veteran officer with a naked scene huddled down and just did nothing and protected himself. That's not what happened. But that served Sheriff Israel's purpose. And here's what's more insulting and worse. Not only didn't he try to reach out to my client, the argument would be, well, there's thousands of deputies. Why would he reach out to my client? Because they were friends, ladies and gentlemen. There will be no violence Friends. in this courthouse. There will be no confrontation. Sheriff Israel worked as a football coach at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas while my client was there. Sheriff Israel's three sons all went to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas when my client was there. Sheriff Israel constantly spoke of my client, even asked him for help when one of his sons got stung with a bee at the school. He called Scott Peterson. When another son was hanging out with the wrong crowd, Scott Peterson was there to help. He had Scott Peterson's cell phone number. All he had to do if he cared about the truth was call him up and say, Why did you go in? How rough was it? Tell us what happened. The evidence will show he didn't do it, and there's only one reason why. Because anything my client said, which would have explained why he didn't go in, would not have served Scott Israel. He didn't want to hear the other side. He needed a scapegoat. It's politics 101. Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's going to be sustained at this point. Mr. Ivers, let's uh, get on to the facts. The evidence will show that Scott Israel said, I give you Scott Peterson. Right, we'll Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's the statement, Mr. Aguilar. So what happened Hold on, sir. sir. Gentlemen, the jury we're not going to talk about the verdict. Is that former sheriff anymore. Just because you believe the evidence is going to show at trial. Go ahead, sir. Got it. So as a result of that press conference, everything goes out there. And then, it's no surprise, the governor gets involved. Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's sustained. Uh, quick sidebar. Can you move it?
the verdict, please. In the Circuit Court of the 15th Judicial Circuit, Criminal Division, in and for Palm Beach County, Florida, case number 21-CF-002938, A and B, Division W, State of Florida v. Travis Rudolph. Defendant, verdict, we the jury find as follows. As to count one, we find the defendant not guilty. As to count two, we find the defendant not guilty. As to count three, we find the defendant not guilty. As to count four, we find the defendant not guilty. So say we all, the 7th day of June, 2023, in West Palm Beach, Palm Beach County, Florida. Would either side like to have the jury polled? All right, thank you. Ladies and gentlemen of the jury, I, on behalf of everyone who is a participant in this trial, would like to thank you for your time and your consideration. I also wish to advise you of the special privileges enjoyed by jurors. In the absence of a court order, no juror can be required to talk about the discussion that occurred in the jury room. Our judicial system relies on juries for consideration of difficult cases. We recognize that a jury's deliberations, discussions, and votes should remain their private affairs so long as they wish it. Therefore, the law gives you a unique privilege not to speak about the jury's work. The lawyers and their representatives are not permitted to initiate any communication with you about the trial. However, you may speak to the lawyers or anyone else about the trial if you wish. In the absence of a court order, you have the right to refuse to speak with anyone. A request may come from those who are simply curious or from those who may seek to find fault with you. It will be up to you to decide whether to preserve your privacy as a juror. I will add that I know that there has been a great deal of publication about this case. You need to keep that in mind. It's very possible you will be contacted by individuals. So keep those rights in mind that I just read to you. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm also now going to pass out to you letters identical to those which I've given your colleagues, the two alternate jurors whom I excused earlier in the afternoon, or I guess it was morning. I would encourage you, please, to take the time. It won't take you more than a minute or two, maybe three minutes, to fill out those questionnaires. I do, as I said before, I do take them very seriously. I look at them. I have made changes in the way in which I conduct jury trials and the manner in which I handle juries and jurors based on those responses to those questionnaires over time. So please take the time to fill those out and throw them in the envelopes that have been re-addressed. Yes, sir. And post it to me. You'll hear that the man that we're talking about, Sheriff Israel, is someone who, when received, he got an email from one of the parents in this case. And the parent asked him, why didn't he go in? Why? He could have prevented my daughter's death. And Sheriff Israel responded, well, we're wondering ourselves. Can't teach courage, you know, his whole thing. But what he failed to tell her was, your daughter was killed on the first floor. He wasn't even at the scene at that time. That's not even, you heard that from the state, that's not even a contradiction. My client was even on the scene, he was heading towards the scene. This is a man who cared so much about himself, the evidence will show, that to this day, I believe that there is a mother whose child was killed on the first floor who blames my client because Sheriff Israel never told her the truth. That is so disturbing. And I'm going to ask him about that. He needs to answer for that publicly. You're going to learn that an investigation began. And the lead investigator, Keith Whitt, who I'm going to have on the stand for quite some time, he's got a lot of explaining to do. It will not be quick, folks. Just a little taste. I will ask him, you know, this issue, the big issue in this case is what my client knew, right? Because he's saying he didn't know where the shots were coming from at certain times. He thought maybe the 1200 building, but maybe the 1300 building, maybe the 700 building. There were so many things going on that my client then says on his radio, while he believes the shooter is still in the building, Perry 
referring to Deputy Perry, who was with someone who was injured. He just announced he was with someone who was injured. He said, Perry, does he know where the shooter is? Asking in real time, does that person know where the shooter is? To so try to find out where it is. And you will learn that Keith Riddick left it out of his report. You and when asked, right why? Contact whomever he said, well, the shooter was gone by then. I said, you mean by a minute and a half? No one on the scene knew the shooter had gone. He left through the west exit. My client didn't know. No one knew. Don't you think that goes to a state of mind? No, I don't. That's what you're dealing with. Or number two, he wrote, there's no evidence to support what my client said to investigators, that he ordered a code red. Yet, Anna Ramos, we will call her, she will take the stand, she works for the school. She heard my client immediately order a code red for the benefit of all the kids, including the ones on the third floor that he is accused of neglecting. She came up to him and gave him a hug at one of the funerals to thank him for ordering the code red because it saved lives. Jeffrey Morford, assistant principal, he heard my client order the code red over the school radio. And then as a result, he said he ordered the code red. He only did it because he told me he heard Peterson do it. But Morford is credible and believable, yet Riddick, the lead investigator, fails to include that information in his report. This was a, you will learn, the evidence will show, a biased and failed investigation from the beginning, which ultimately led to charges like child neglect. We'll focus more on that throughout this case, but that somehow all of this leads to child neglect, charging him as if he's a mother who fails to give their child water or food. Or a teacher. Objection to argument. Yeah, that's sustained. Go ahead, sir. The evidence, will believe, the evidence will show. The evidence will show that the charge of a child in the glut plays. More, more on that throughout this case. Now, let's talk about the facts of what occurred and what really happened. And you've got paper and pen. Make sure that you understand exactly what occurred. Let's do a general overview first. Prosecutor kind of went over it with you. I want to start big and then we'll get down into the minutia. I absolutely want to make sure at all times you understand this fully. If there's ever a time that I think I might need to go back and make it clear, forgive me. It's only because I want you guys to fully understand what's going on here, okay? So, first, this is a kind of an overview of the school. Now, while this board is small, it in no way represents the 45 acres that the school is. I need you all to understand that because unfortunately we're not going to get to go to the school together. We're not. So I'm going to have to do the best I can to recreate it. And like going to Paris and seeing the Eiffel Tower or Egypt and the, and the pyramids, there is no way to properly recreate it. There's not. We're at a loss. So I'm going to do my best. Objection, Your Honor. Yeah, that's a stain. Uh, another quick sidebar, please. A representation of the school. We'll use this to get a perspective. This is building number one. Let's start there. Building number one is where my client's office is, where, it's, where it was anyway, Scott's office was, and where he was while, the, while he got information that there was firecracker complaint inside the 1200 building. Okay? So understand, he's here. Let me say general. Okay? This is the 1200 building where it occurred. This is literally like a football field. I mean, this is, this is far. Then you have next to it the 1300 building, and then you'll hear a reference in my opening and throughout this case, the football field. 
This is over here. This is literally hundreds of yards away. Hundreds of yards from the 1200 building. So when you hear, for example, Deputy Kratz, who will testify that he went on his radio during the shooting, while the shooter was actually on the third floor, and yells, shots fired by the football field. Football field. And my client's trying to figure out in real time where the shots are coming from. Deputy Kratz is referring to over here, hundreds of yards away, not where the actual shots were coming from. Kratz will tell you in his own words, he literally thought the shooter was 30 feet away from him on the football field. So this is the overview. Okay, I'll refer to it if needed, but just so you have a perspective. So my client is here, building number one. So he's in, we can take Jeff, he's right down. Is there a way just to take that off for one second? We'll be putting it back up. Thank you, Jeff. So my client was in his office before the shooting took place. And what he was doing is he was investigating a felony. One of the students, an 18-year-old, had a fake driver's license. And what he was doing was he was researching at the time the statute, the felony statute, so he can tell the father who was coming to the school and the daughter, he wasn't going to arrest her or anything, but he did want to know. It's a very serious offense to possess a counterfeit driver's license. So he was busy researching that. His phone was across the room being charged. But he did over here at one point, wait, shots fired, not shots fired, excuse me, firecrackers in the 1200 building, firecrackers. Now, it was Valentine's Day, there had been fireworks, you know, let off in the building before. It wasn't like, oh my goodness, at that point. So he and Kelvin Greenleaf begin to leave. When they start to run is when all of a sudden the fire alarm goes off. You'll see on the video, they start to head towards there, and all of a sudden, fire alarm. And then they start to run. And let me just stop. The evidence will not show that then he goes, wait a second, those firecrackers or fireworks could be gunfire. Let me go jump into my car and drive away. You will learn that that never happened. See, that we could all agree would be neglectful. But he immediately runs, and then he gets picked up by Andrew Medina, who's driving a golf cart. And the evidence will show you that at no point on their way to the 1200 building does Andrew Medina share with my client some really helpful material. Like he saw someone, that nutty cruise guy, walking with a duffel bag or some type of large bag that potentially contained some serious items in there, and then he walked into the 1200 building. He never shared that with my client. That would have been real helpful. To this day, you'll hear... Kelvin Greenleaf testified that he's still angered to this day that Medina never shared that information with any of them. That would have completely changed it. My client would have known. Wait. Objection argument. Yeah, that's the thing, Mr. Agarwal. At this I'll point, see. I'm going to have to remind you, as I've done repeatedly, yes. uh, this isn't closing argument. This is your opening statement, okay. sir. Let's stick to what you believe the evidence is going to show. Go ahead, sir. The evidence will show, because we will call Kelvin Greenleaf if they don't, that he never heard Medina at all, share with them the information that he had, which could have led to a different trajectory. So now, when he gets to the scene, and you all take a look at this, and it's going to be a little overwhelming at first. I promise I'm going to break it down for you, okay? But see, it's critical that you understand where the shots were coming from, okay? All right, let's stay general on this at first, okay? First, this is the same, we got the same thing that the prosecutor put up in his, in his open, but there's more detail, so it would be accurate. First, understand this represents the first floor. Even though these two are together, it's kind of overlapping. The second floor overlaps to show that it's over the first floor. But this is the first floor right here. And second floor is here. And then third floor is here. Everybody with me so far? Okay? We've got north west, east, south, so you can see that, okay? And don't look at the shots just yet, okay? That's something we'll, we'll get into in just a moment. Let's start general. As I indicated to Mr. you, Mr. Mr. Agro, I'm sorry. If you need your support staff to help you move the stuff around, I'm going to ask you to step out of the jury box, please. So you need to be out here in the well of the courtroom. Okay. If you want to do the signs one at a time, you that's it. fine. 
Uh, but uh, That's I can't have you in the jury box. Okay. Thank you, sir. Yes. Okay, so I'll stand over here. Everyone still sitting? Okay. This is worth repeating. Again, big picture. Six minutes and 36 seconds, total time he's spending. We're going to show you exactly how we account for that time, okay? And this is not in dispute. I don't, I don't think that, that anyone's going to dispute these times. We made sure that they're actually from the material we received from the state, okay? Deputy Peterson was there for the last four minutes and 15 seconds. And the final two minutes of the four minutes and 15 seconds, I'm jumping ahead, were spent with the shooter on the third floor, shooting west, the furthest possible distance from where my client was. So let's say general again. What we didn't learn just yet, and you're about to learn, is this building, the 1200 building, is 73 yards long. The evidence will show that we're talking about three quarters of a football field. And so that you guys have an idea of what that looks like, I'd like to show you so you can have a perspective of what the building looks like. Judge, if we can turn that back on. This picture doesn't even have the entire building in it. It was the best one that we got. So what I want you to take a look at is this. Let me hit play for a second. This is, here we go, yeah, this one. Okay, from one end all the way to the other end. Take a look. As you can see, this is a huge, huge building. It is nothing like I'm sure you imagine. To give you further perspective, this is to show you just the size and the distance of what we're talking about. What you're seeing now is the last two minutes, as I told you, the shooter was in the 1240 building, sniper firing out of two windows. What I'm showing this for what I'm showing this to you right now is just to see the perspective from where that shooter is to where the 700 building is and where my client was located. Try to give you some perspective. I'll pause it at one point. And by the way, what you're looking at is a recreation done by the state of what the shooter was doing. I'm just going to let it run. I will not stop it, but I'll talk over. The 
This is the west side of the building. This is the side that Aaron Price was shot on. And with my client, he was on the other side of this building. 73 yards away. There's the door that you see right there where Aaron Price was shot outside of. And then all the way in the distance, on the other side is where my client was. And to the right is the 700 building. And that becomes key because a lot of kids come out of that building, hear the same shots my client did, and thought that those shots were coming from a different location. Okay. So let's continue. The first shots that my client hears, and you'll be able to see it on the video. Everything is corroborated by the video. The first shots occur here, 223.25. 2-23-25. This is, as you can see, the shooter is pointing his gun west, in a westerly direction. My client, by the way, is approaching the east side door, about to go in to check out a firecracker complaint. Not an active shooter. He was not there during the time that the shooter had made his way through the first floor and killed people. No one went on the radio. You'll be able to see the entire dispatch. No one said... Shots fired in the first floor, kids being killed. Nothing. He didn't get any of that. You'll be able to see, you'll read it yourself. He gets there, and both him and you'll hear from Greenleaf, they believe they're investigating the firecracker complaint. The sh because the door was open, shots get fired. My client hears a loud boom. He doesn't think, wait, kids are being killed in the 1200 building. He just hears a loud boom. The first thing he does is he's approaching the door, and he never opened up the door. He never got to, if he did, if he ever looked in the window or got close enough to do it, he probably would have seen the carnage that was created by Cruz. But he didn't get that chance. He walks close to the door. He hears those shots. The Las Vegas shooting, you will learn, just occurred months before. So sniper fire is one of the possibilities. You hear shots from outside. He feels vulnerable, you will learn, the evidence will show. But the first thing he does is he doesn't run for cover. He stands there, out in the open, and immediately does what a cop does. You report shots fired. Here are his dispatch <coughs> remarks. And the first one he makes at 223.26, note that it was one second one second after Aaron Feist is shot from outside, outside, my client immediately gets on his police radio and he says, be advised, we have possible, could be firecrackers. So let's start there. Four minutes and 15 seconds, the evidence will show, starts to tick when he gets on the scene. He's only got four minutes and 15 seconds to get to the shooter and neutralize the threat. But what you're going to learn is he's still struggling with, wait, at first... Wait, firecrackers? And then he says, I think we have shots fired. Possible shots fired. And 1200 building is a reference because he's standing 10 feet from the 1200 building. You will see a couple of references to the 1200 building, and the evidence will show that that is his positioning at the time. Not, I'm hearing shots fired with certainty from inside the 1200 building. He never says that. The closest he gets, as you will see, is by inside. He's struggling. When he hears more shots, you will see, the evidence will show, that one of the options is it's by the 1200 building, because the building's 73 yards long, and that contains a large area, and also possibly inside sniper firing, which is exactly what it turned out to be. All that's in play. You will learn that we know so much now about what actually happened. But it's yeah, that's the stance. The evidence will show that neither he nor the officers in real time had all the information that we have today. That's just a fact. So everything in his mind is in play. Everything, you will learn, is a possibility at that moment. Now, this is telling, because right after this, again, we're talking about 20 some odd seconds later, my client is saying, make sure we get some units over here. I need to shut down Stone and Douglas. This is the first of five transmissions where my client's making it clear, we need to shut down this school. He doesn't say, we need to get into the 1200 building because kids are being killed. He says we need to shut down the school. 
because the evidence will show that he and the other officers will testify to it. They all believed that the gunfire could be coming from anywhere and that if, as school is letting out, parents come in, students are coming out, they could all be hit by gunfire around the building, anywhere on campus. Not, the evidence will show, not that everything was contained within the 1200 building and someone needs to rush in there. That's what the evidence will show. So my client, you will learn, went with Kelvin Jr. He doesn't stand in the open, but right before he does, not only does he make his first transmission to send the cavalry, you'll hear many officers saying that my client was of great service to them because they didn't know about the shooting until he announced it. I mean, he set in motion the wave of all the officers coming to the scene. He did his job. You will learn then that he also gets on a school radio before, again, going to his tactical position of cover. Before he does that, he gets on a school radio and he announces, Code Red, for the benefit of everybody on that campus. Then, he doesn't stand out in the open, you will learn. He goes and he makes sure that he and Kelvin Greenleaf are protected over here. Because there's, you will learn that both of them, Kelvin Greenleaf will say, listen, you don't stand out in the open. In fact, my client even said at one point to Kelvin and others, get away, get away, get out of the way. I want to highlight just some of the other things that my client said in real time. And I also want to we'll go into greater detail during the trial okay, about what each of the shots meant and what he was thinking throughout this. But ultimately, you will learn that there was literally in every classroom, it took them 30 minutes to clear the first floor, second floor, third floor. The evidence will show that even if my client knew, which he didn't, where precisely the shots were coming from at 4 minutes and 15 seconds when that started, there is no way he would have made a difference. No way. Objection argument. Yeah, that's the thing. The evidence will also show that you'll hear from the officers who are over here, west of the building, that even when the shooter was in the middle of the third floor, that these officers thought that the shots were coming from a different location, outside, not inside. <laughs> Just a few more transmissions I want to go through. And again, we have the whole trial to be together to go through everything. I want to bring it all out in my opening. We'll, we'll get to it. Okay? I'm anxious for you to hear the evidence. Okay? My client is saying, we don't have a description yet. We just hear shots fired. It appears to be shots fired. Again, you see him trying to lock down the school. Get the school locked down, gentlemen. Get it locked down. What that's doing, the evidence will show, is it's keeping officers and people away. Now, did that turn out to be, in retrospect, the evidence will show the wrong decision? Objection. Yeah, that's the same. Ladies and gentlemen, the purpose of these opening statements is just to give you a preview of what the lawyers believe the evidence will be. Uh, Mr. Agrash, I'm going to admonish you at this point. Uh, please refrain from any further argument. Uh, continue and or conclude your opening statement. Please. Thank you. you. You will hear officers testify that in, by shutting down the school, officers didn't get in. And in retrospect, they will tell me... Objection, finish. argument. Yeah, that's the thing. That's the thing. Go ahead, sir. Great. So, again, at 225.56, this is all during while the shooter is shooting. My client's saying, we're locking down the school. We're locking it down. He's reporting, I hear shots fired. So this allegation that he doesn't then include that he heard extra shots, it's right there. He's telling you, shots fired. And this is key. This is why I put it in red. My client said 228. So we're talking about literally 25 seconds after the shooter was done shooting. But understand something. The evidence will show. My client didn't know, nor did any of the officers know, that the shooter was gone. He slipped out, you will learn, to the west side door the opposite side that he came in, and blended in and got away. So all the officers are thinking for quite some time that the shooter or shooters, and by the way, no one knew it was just one. You'll hear from the officers saying there's the plus one rule, that if you think there's one, think that there may be two. If you think that there's three, there may be four. So understand that the evidence will show now we know there's one twisted monster. But at the time, they're thinking there may be multiple. That's what the evidence will show. But here's what my client says. Do not approach the 12 
or 1,300 buildings, stay at least 500 feet away at this point. You will get to decide why my client is including the 1,300 building instead of just saying 1,200 building. He's also saying, Harry, does he know where the shooter is? Asking in real time, does he know where the shooter is? You will learn that the lead investigator, he will tell you that he left that out of his report because he didn't think that was relevant. Lockdown, right now, nobody's leaving the school, my client says. And still, look at this time, 2.45.25. The shooter's been gone for 18 minutes. And my client is telling everybody, between the 12 and 1300 building is the last time we heard shots. Between the 12 and 1300 building. That's what all the officers heard, that's what they believed. Now I know you're wondering, didn't he get any information on his radio? Right? You'll learn that kids had cell phones. You will learn that they did call in that there is a shooter. And that shooter is located in the 1200 building. But you will learn that those calls went to Carl Springs Police Department, not Broward Sheriff's Office. You will learn that nobody conveyed the information that went to Carl Springs Police Department with the Broward Sheriff's Office. You will learn that nobody ordered that the radios be patched so that two agencies who are supposed to be working together could know all the same information. You will learn that Carl Springs police officers knew certain information because those calls came in to Carl Springs. But that the Broward Sheriff's Office officers, like my client, you will see what they learned, and at no time did they ever, ever inform him that there were shots fired inside the 1200 building and that children were being harmed. Even Sheriff Israel will come and tell you that that was a colossal failure that hindered my client. He will also admit to you that the phones, I'm sorry, the radios that they were using failed miserably. Meaning officers, you will learn, will come in here and say that they were trying to communicate with fellow officers and that the radios were throttling. <coughs> so when they would try to make any type of announcement or hear things, they couldn't, it was, one officer will testify, it was like having a brick in your hand. Yeah, they have good training, you'll learn, but they never have training where their radios don't work. You will learn that officers will say, yeah, they have training, but they never have training where you have no idea where the shooter's located, just a general area. I have to mention Denise Reed, because the state still, they, they, they read her name as somebody they might call. And if they do, I will tell you, this is a assistant principal, who may testify, and she may tell you that during the shooting, allegedly, she got within 15 feet of my client and allegedly claimed, hey, there's shooting going on, whatever she's going to say. I, I don't know exactly what version she's going to give to you. But something like indicating that my client must have known then that shots were coming. Ladies and gentlemen, the evidence will show that there is a video showing her movement down the hallway, and you will see for your own eyes that in spite of her giving that sworn testimony, that she had this contact with my client, she literally is walking without breaking stride and then goes into the band room and stays in there during the whole shooting. You can clearly see with your own eyes she never, ever had any contact with my client in spite of what she may allege if the state calls her. <coughs> Ladies and gentlemen, as I conclude, I want to briefly touch on the perjury count. Just for a moment. Detective Curcio will testify that when my client came in for this interview, it was two days after the shooting. He wasn't under investigation at all. That didn't come until 
A year later, were charges brought. So he comes in, and Detective Curcio was the detective in the Nicholas Cruz homicide case. So my client, being a witness, has to be investigated. My client wasn't on the hot seat at the time. My client had no reason to think that he was going to be in trouble at all. The evidence will show that there were just questions asked. So what happened? What did you see? What happened? And specifically, Detective Curcio will tell you that he asked this in a chronological order. Like, okay, so when you got to the scene, you get to that building, how many shots do you hear? My client said two to three, because it's exactly how many he heard. And we know that because the first shots he hears is Aaron Price being shot, and he was shot two to three times. That's the perjury count. Detective Curcio will tell you that he never then asks my client, how many total shots did you hear from beginning to end? He will tell you, yeah, I didn't think that question was necessary. That's the perjury count. The second part of the perjury count is they claim that my client saw some kids leave the 1200 building. While my client's on his radios, while he's telling kids in the 700 building, stay back, while he's thinking about a million things with the stress of the world on his shoulders. Objection argument. Yeah, that's sustained. The evidence will show that they're claiming my client didn't see kids running out of the 1200 building. I'm quite certain you will not see any video of those kids actually leaving. I would imagine if they're representing it, that kids did leave the 1200 building. He told Detective Curcio he didn't see kids leaving the 1200 building. There will be no evidence that those kids ever came up to my client or had blood on them or something to indicate that they need to be spoken to or investigated. The evidence will show he didn't lie about that at all. Another charge for which he did not commit. Objection argument. Yeah, that's the same. Mr. Iglarsh, uh, because of your continued objectionable comments, I'm going to ask you to conclude your opening statement at this time. Go ahead, sir. I'm concluding, ladies and gentlemen. The, the evidence will show that my client did not commit any of the offenses alleged. He was sacrificed and thrown under the bus. Objection argument. And yep, that evidence, is sustained. And the only verdict in this case, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your kind attention, the only verdict that speaks the truth in this case based upon the evidence is not guilty.